All right. <clears throat> so as I mentioned just a moment ago, um, we'll start using WMS on Wednesday. So if you haven't yet downloaded and installed that, please do. Um, the next homework assignment I've just put onto Blackboard, and uh, it only has two questions. One is related to unit hydrograph and time of concentration. And then the other question is just walking through the same stuff that we're going to do in class today related to the web soil survey. So, you know, what we're going to take probably 30 minutes doing a demo on in today's class, I think the homework problem that's related to that maybe will take you 15 or 20 minutes. And so uh, those two problems should be submitted to Blackboard um, before class on Friday. So, um, yeah, we'll get into WMS on Wednesday. Today, I wanted to um, show you a couple of things on a website called the Web Soil Survey. And it's a service of the National Resource Conservation Service section of the USDA. So let's go to that first. We'll come back to Google Earth Pro if you're downloading that in the background. Now, the uh, Web Soil Survey is incredibly, incredibly useful, but I think they have it running on a really weak server because it just takes forever to load. So we're going to have to learn a new level of patience to uh, use the website. But if you just do a search of Web Soil Survey, what we're going to do is start the Web Soil Survey, and it'll bring up a map that's an aerial photo. I don't know what it'll initially be zoomed in on, probably the entire United States. And we're just going to zoom in on a couple of areas in Cabell County and look at the soil characteristics and see what kind of data is available. And um, in particular, what we're interested in knowing is the infiltration rate of soils and um, the hydrologic soil group. Because if we can use GIS tools, which is computerized mapping tools, to calculate the curve number for us, then that can be a really useful resource when we're modeling watersheds. Watersheds can have hundreds of different soil types, thousands of different uh, land classifications. If you think about a big watershed and all the many different things that would be on it, where there's a building in one lo location, grass in another, there may be agricultural fields, streams, natural woods. So there can be all these overlapping polygons of land uses and soil types. Each one of them is going to have a different curve number and uh, it would be nearly impossible for us to go through and do that assessment manually. And so we'll rely on GIS to do that for us when we're using WMS. And so today what we're going to look at is the soil type component of that question. Because curve number, remember, is a two-part question. It's the uh, union of the four soil classifications, A through D, along with a lot of different land uses. All right, so we're starting off by looking at the entire United States. I'm sure you've used plenty of online mapping tools in the past, and so <clears throat> the controls across the top, many of these are going to look familiar in terms of the zoom in, zoom out, pan, global view, which is zoom out all the way to the full extent. There's also an information in identify tool where if you use this and then click on a certain uh, location, depending on what map is visible, then it will give you the characteristics of the polygon. These are for defining areas of interest. And it's a way of kind of like creating a bookmark of a location that you're interested in and being able to share that bookmark with someone else or save a file and come back to the same location again in the future. Because, you know, it, it wouldn't be convenient to tell someone, zoom in on West Virginia, then zoom in on Cabell County, then zoom in on this particular road. Like a, a written description of that sort wouldn't be precise enough to indicate the precise uh, location that you want somebody to analyze. And so defining an area of interest is a way for us to do that. Um, so let's just start by zooming in. So that's the default tool here is zoom in. And let's zoom in on the tri-state area. So Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia, that'll get us Cabell County. 
we zoom in on that location. For the homework assignment that's due on um, Friday, I've given you an area of interest as an archived zip file. I'll show you in a moment how you can load those in to define an area of interest. All right, so here's Cabell County, next to it Putnam, above it Mason, and so on. So let's scroll down a little bit more. And we're going to just zoom in on the middle of Cabell County. So zoom in again. And it doesn't matter necessarily if you have the exact same area as I do. But it looks like this is the mall. Yeah, here's the mall, the off-ramp to the mall. Here's the target that's falling into the, falling off the hill. Everybody's seen those pictures by now, right? I was thinking of taking my drone over there and getting some photos. Um, it's a pretty interesting situation. I'm not quite as dramatic as the airport when the uh, runway was sliding off the mountain a couple of years ago, but people are generally more familiar with Target than the Charleston Airport. All right, so we've got just some area here. And what we're going to do is use this area to navigate some of the details that are available in the corresponding soil map. So if you click across the, the top here, we've got different tabs. And so switch over from defining the area of interest to the soil map. So click that and we develop further patience. This is what the internet was like when it first came out and I was learning how to use the internet. We had these dial-up modems. Uh, I haven't specified the area of interest. All right. Let's define that by... Um, the tools for area of interest, let's define it with this rectangle. So it's not just going to assume that it's whatever's in the field of view, but we have to define it with the rectangle. So click and drag to include the mall and also some wilderness areas. This includes some residential areas. So we got a variety of stuff in this area of interest. You don't have to make it a rectangle. You could make a polygon if you wanted to like trace the boundaries of a ridge line or if you know if if you're familiar with your property line boundaries and wanted to trace them you can do a polygon area of interest as well so for example let's say what if i did it wrong and i wanted to clear it you click this clear button on the left and then i'll show you how the polygon tool works the only thing that's different compared to that rectangular one is you have to double click at the end to terminate the uh, polygon area of interest. So if you're going to be defining it that way, then you'd start at some location and you can click as many times as you want. And then when you want to stop, you just double click and then with that double click, it knows that you're not going to give it any more vertices for defining the polygon. and. Uh, so there's some area now that's under investigation. I think now it'll let us change the tab over to the soil map at the top. It's waiting. At, all right, there it is. Okay, so soil map. So look at the stuff it is telling us here. On the left-hand side, it gives us a, uh, a table of different map units, and these are now this is where I'm on thin ice because I'm not a geologist and it's been 30-something uh, years since I took a geology class. So um, these different abbreviations are uh, indicating standardized soil types that have certain characteristics of what it's composed of, what depth you'd have to go to, the type of... Um, the type of slope it's usually found at. So we could click on one of these, and this is telling you, you know, whether it's a dominant soil type. So Gilpin Upshur is one that there's usually a lot of in Cabell County. So if we scroll down, here's Gilpin Upshur. There's different types of it. 14.2, okay, here's one. 35 to 70% slopes, yeah. So. Um, the reason why slope is significant is that 
this data is generated not by people going out and doing like a grid assessment of soil properties, but I think I've mentioned before that they did a handful of soil characterization and then they look for locations on the map that have similar topography because what they're assuming is that, for example, if they went to a location that had a slope of 35 to 70 percent and it was within 100 meters of a stream and it was at a certain elevation range and they noticed that in a couple of different locations it was this Gilpin Upshur type soil, then what they've done is they've extrapolated and said all of the similar uh, topography that has those same characteristics, we're going to assume that there's Gilpin Upshur there. And it may not be accurate in a handful of places, but on a watershed level, you know, if you zoom out and you're considering land management and kind of uh, large scale areas, then it'll be true enough. So if we click on this description, it's going to tell us some of the characteristics of Gilpin Upshur soil when it's found on a 35 to 70 percent slope. It's going to tell us things like the, uh, the uh, hydraulic conductivity of the soil. It'll tell us the uh, typical hydrologic soil group. Oh, I did click on that, right? There it is. All right, so the range of elevation in which this type of soil is typically found uh, typical mean annual precipitation range, the amount of frost-free days per year, where it's found is on hill slopes. The typical profile, this is pretty interesting because it's saying if you go to this location, what you're going to find in the first zero to one inches down is decomposed plant material, you know, leaves, twigs, bark. Go a little bit deeper, then there's silt loam, a different type of silt loam, loam, channery, silty clay loam. I didn't know what channery was. I had to look that up. That is a, a geology word that means like broken up pieces of shale. So it's, if you've ever tried gardening in Cabell County, what you know is it's mostly broken up rock that's in the soil. You're trying to grow in gravel and uh, like broken shale. So that's channery. My garden and lawn is very channery. And then if you go down far enough, eventually you'll get to bedrock. And so this is what we would find at those locations. And from all of those details, it's showing you the hydraulic conductivity when it's saturated. So the most limiting layer is going to be having a uh, hydraulic conductivity of 0.2 to 2 inches per hour. That's a pretty high range, not really useful. But what is useful is this, hydrologic soil group C, because that is what we would need to be able to determine a curve number at a particular location, is we'd need to know what type of soil is at that spot and then what's on top of the soil, whether it's woods, whether it's asphalt, and so on. So a lot of interesting stuff here, but um, when we're using WMS, it goes in and reads the data that it needs automatically. It's not going to require us to do a lot of interaction, and so you don't need to memorize these different types of soil complexes, but you know, if you were expected to give a report in a certain area and they need all of the details, this is some place where you can find all of the details. Let's move over from the soil map to the soil data explorer, but before we do, I wanted to show you that you can make a, uh, a printable version, like a printable report, and I think I asked you to do that on, on the homework assignment. And so it's just as simple as clicking on printable version, because we've got the table, we've got the map, and if you click printable version, I think it creates like a PDF version of the same that you can save and submit. All right. So it'll have a title here. You give it a subtitle. Homework 7. View. Okay. 
So far it's been loading faster in this demo than it was up in my office. Mm, well, it did give me a, a nice PDF earlier. I'm not sure what the problem is now. <laughs> Here I was saying it was working better. Uh, when it fails, just try it again. Let's see. I won't go for it a third time though. Did anybody do it and it gave you a printable report? It's working for you? Okay. Maybe it was the subtitle. I don't know. View. There's my report. All right, so it's already created as a PDF, so I could just save that PDF and then merge it in with other stuff if it was a homework assignment. But it's got the map. We've got coordinates on the map, a scale. It's a pretty nice map, a legend. And then all of that table of the different characteristics in the area of interest. So it's the area of different soil types and a percent of the overall area of interest. All right, so that's nice. That's the soil map tab. If we go over to the soil data explorer tab, we're going to look at things like uh, some of the suitability of the soil. Um, if you're a farmer, these kinds of tools can help you to find locations that are suitable for different types of crops. If you're interested in forestry, it can help you to identify locations that are likely to have the type of trees that you're interested in cutting down. Um, if you are trying to make concrete and you need to find gravel or sand, there are ways to all of the different kind of land resources that you can think of there's some sort of an assessment. It's really an extrapolation because remember, this isn't based on a definitive survey, but more of just a, uh, an extrapolation of what's typically occurring in locations that have similar slopes, proximity to streams, proximity to a ridge line, elevation, and so on. So there's a series of different variables it's looking at to make a best guess of what the soil type is at a location. So now that I've clicked on the Soil Data Explorer, there's a new set of tabs. I've never actually looked at the Intro to Soils tab. I imagine it just gives you some sort of a, uh, a document that explains how the data is derived. Yeah, it looks like this is some sort of a uh, reading that's available. We'll go straight to the suitabilities and uh, try and go to the uh, construction materials because I think it's interesting to see what locations we might be able to find gravel for instance if uh, if you were wanting to open up your own gravel pit where might be some locations that are likely to have gravel and it may be nowhere uh, in Cabell County I'm not sure how common that is so what we're going to do is click on view rating for gravel source. It takes a moment and then it should give us a different map and it'll be shaded based on potential hot spots for gravel. I assume those are the ones that are shaded in yellow. Okay, view description. Gravel, it's an explanation of what gravel is. Okay, pretty interesting. And um, as before, you could make a printable version of this map. You could zoom in and get the coordinates of these gravel hotspots. Uh, so we did gravel, let's check out uh, sand see if there are any spots that are likely sources of sand. View rating, we'll bring it up. I don't know if we have any sand. So um, some of the other stuff that they've got on here related to uh, vegetative productivity could be used for agricultural 
assessment, so different types of trees, whether you'd be able to grow corn. Now keep in mind, this is a nationwide service. So when it's talking about Minnesota Crop Productivity Index, I don't even know if it would calculate the index for West Virginia, since that is a, a Minnesota index. Let's give it a shot. Never actually tried that before. No, because we're not in Minnesota. <laughs> But we do have black walnuts, and that's a West Virginia specific thing, so I guess it would be a pity not to run it. I've got some black walnuts on my property. The dog likes to eat them. All right. So when it comes to black walnut suitability, it looks like what it's looking at is soil pH, water capacity, the slope to terrace. I, I think this is maybe the, uh, the slope of the ground in the location. Hmm. Yeah, pretty useful. So that's the suitabilities tab. Um, soil properties is maybe just cutting straight to the chase that we'll mostly be interested in for watershed modeling because one of the soil properties that we can ask it to display is the hydrologic soil group. And if I remember correctly, that may, it's either physical properties or soil qualities. So let's expand that. No, it's not a physical property. Although, now that we're on the physical property, I am interested in the uh, hydraulic conductivity. Let's have it put together a map of hydraulic conductivity. I'm not sure what that would look like. Oh, it needs to know how deep we're interested in. So let's say we're top depth from one inch, so we're going below the organic material, down six inches. So at a depth of one to six inches, this is telling us the hydraulic conductivity range of the soils here. Micrometers per second. That's an odd unit for the hydraulic conductivity. Micrometers per second have to convert that into meters per day before it makes any sense to me. But the data is there. But what we really want is the hydrolo hydrologic soil group. So soil qu qualities, and here it is, hydrologic soil group. So if you click on that and get a map, it's going to tell us in this area of interest how much of it is a, B, C, and D. And if this watershed is like most of the rest, it's mostly going to be C, a little bit of A, just a tiny bit of good soils with like a uh, high hydraulic conductivity, some B soils, but mostly C. Interestingly, there's no D soils. Oh, this, it says either B or D. I'm not sure why the uncertainty there. Then there are some where it's not known. When we're using WMS, one of the things that we'll have to do is tell it what to assume when there's missing data. And there's not a lot of missing data in this particular, like with where we're zoomed out, it looks like we don't have hydrologic soil group um, assigned for, let's see, 4%, 7%, 1%. So like about 10 or 12 percent of the watershed doesn't have hydrologic soil group, but it's under the mall. So the mall is completely impermeable, so it really doesn't matter. You know, it could be A or it could be D, and it's going to have the same curve number because it's just a bunch of roof area and pavement. But in any case, when we're using WMS, we have to tell it what to assume when it's missing data. And the conservative thing is to assume that the soil has a low hydraulic conductivity, you know, that it's soil class C, 
to give you the worst case scenario that the, that would have a higher curve number and then if it turns out the watershed actually has better quality soil then you're a little bit better off than you otherwise would be. So typically what we'll do is we'll just say assume hydrologic soil group C for the areas where the data is missing because that's most of the watershed anyway. So chances are if we don't have data for that location it's probably the same as the dominant hydrologic soil group for the rest of the watershed as well. So that is the soil properties tab. Um, if we want to, we could make a we could make a report of this as well. You know that that same report that we got from the soil map where it creates a PDF of it that's available to us. But let's say that we wanted to not just download like a PDF report, but we wanted to download like all of the data, meaning like the shape files, the database, like the, the real thing, the stuff that's in the background that this visual map is being generated from. Then we could go to the download, download soils data tab and broadly speaking there's two main categories of soil data that's available. There's one that's called StatsGo, which is kind of a low resolution uh, soil database. And there's one that's called Surgo. And Surgo is a high resolution soil database. So it's telling us that Surgo is available, but before we look at the Surgo data, um, let's look at the StatsGo, because StatsGo is kind of a course map where within a county, it would maybe only tell you two or three different soil groups in a county. It's, it's for looking at the whole United States all at once, then the StatsGo maybe would be an appropriate soil map to use. And to give you an idea of like how relatively detailed or coarse they are, if you look at the West Virginia data set, it's only 5.3 megabytes for the whole state. When we go over to the Surgo data, which is the higher resolution one, uh, each county will be at least double that. So it gives you the idea that, you know, if the whole state is five megabytes, but then in the case of Surgo, you're getting twice as much data for each county, and there's like 55 counties in West Virginia, right? I didn't go to elementary school here, so I don't, I don't know the details like that. Um, what did they call that, the golden horseshoe? How many people in here have the golden horseshoe? That was like the trivia thing. Just one? You guys are pathetic. <laughs> All right, well, sorry, I don't know what, I don't know what got into me, uh, <laughs> insulting you. All right, five megabytes for the uh, stats go. If we go over to the Surgo, then we'll browse to Cabell County. I think it's probably gonna be 10 megabytes or larger. And it's got um, shape files, which tells you the, like the physical location of each thing and also all of the databases like hydraulic conductivity, the, uh, the moisture content, slopes, and so on. So West Virginia. Cabell County. All right, so it looks like that data file is 14.6, and so three times the size for one county out of 55. So it's, it's a lot more data. It's like 100 times more data. And uh, I'll open both up when we start using WMS so you can see like how relatively coarse the data resolution is in the case of uh, StatsGo. Any questions about the web soil survey. Oh, there is one more thing I wanted to show you. That's how to import um, an area of interest file. Or, you know, we could export the area of interest. So we have defined this area of interest. So let's say you wanted to share it with somebody later on. Go down here to export and uh, export AOI as a, sh a zipped shape file.
click export, and then it'll just give you a .zip file that you can save. And this is actually pretty useful because um, there are other programs that you could use this same shape file with. So I've just defined it and downloaded it. And um, so let's look. I think it put it in my downloads folder. I'm going to double click on that and actually extract it. There's multiple files in there. And I'll open it up in just a moment and show you what they look like. I'm going to save it to a location, a temporary folder that I'll be able to find it later. Um, I'm exporting it to mall. So there is a, uh, this is probably hard to see at the back of the classroom, but it's got a shape file, which is the shape that I drew, like this polygon, the different lines that make that shape. And then um, this particular area of interest file doesn't have much in the database so that this dot dbf is pretty empty um, in the soil data if if we downloaded the entire uh, sergo data file then there would be a lot in that database the uh, dot prj file tells it the projection so different types of online maps have uh, projections that account for the curvature of the earth and different coordinate <coughs> systems. And the .prj file helps the computer to read the data and put it in the, in the right location. So for instance, um, let's use Google Earth to open up that same shape file that we just exported. So I just, through the, uh, through the web soil survey, generated an area of interest and exported it. Um, before I go to Google Earth, let me actually show you how you could import an area of interest. So I'm going to clear the area of interest that we've been working on. Um, area of interest. Clear. So under the properties, if you clear the area of interest, then it'll make this go away that I drew before. And then I'm just going to uh, import a different zip file. This is what you're going to have to do on the homework. So you would uh, browse to the file location that I've provided. So when you download it, it'll probably go into your downloads folder unless you have it saved somewhere else. But I've just saved it here, homework 7 area of interest shape file. So you select it and then set it, and it's just going to automatically snap the map location to the, uh, to the spot that I want you to analyze for the homework. So reading, reading them in is just as easy, if not easier, than uh, exporting them. So this is the location I want you to analyze for the homework. All right. So with that said, let's try and with uh, Google Earth Pro, open up the mall area shape file that we were just working with. And you can go here to File, Import. And um, the, the type of file that it's looking for is limited. Like if, if we browse to the location where we know it is, like I put it into C, Temp, Mall, we're not going to, well, Mall Region, there's nothing there. Because just the file type is filtering out anything except for text files. So you can select what type of file you want it to import, and there's lots of different options. So we're going to bring in a shapefile.shp. And if I click that, now the mall region.shp is visible. Or you can just scroll down and tell it, show all the files. So it's this mall region.shp file. I'm going to have it open, and then it's asking, uh, you know, do you want to define a color and other feature, other style properties for the features that you're going to be bringing in? So I'll say yes. So it's going to say, um, like, it's white that it's coming in. Uh, what elevation should the polygon be at? Because remember, it's some it's some line. It's like a series of lines that I drew. 
And so it's, I'm just going to tell it to put that at the ground level, make that polygon at the ground level, not above the ground, at the ground level. So that's fine. OK. And then it's asking me to save like the, uh, the properties of how that shape file should be displayed. So it's zooming in on the location. And hopefully, if things go well, it'll show us the area of the mall. So there's the mall. And let me turn on. It's not enabled the, uh, the shape file. See how it's not checked over here in the window? If I click the box, there it is. And when I was looking at this earlier, before class, there was a strange thing where if we zoom in in certain areas, we may see trees poking out. So if you've never used Google Earth before, one of the strange things is like we're looking at an angle right now. This isn't a straight top-down view. And it takes a little bit of time to get used to how it's working. I think the scroll bar, if you press down on the scroll bar and then down, Whereas if we go up, now it's more of a top view. All right, so now this is at a completely top view at this point. I'll turn this back on and then zoom in. Well, I'm happy to see that the trees aren't poking out. Because um, sometimes what Google Earth is able to do is, oh, here they are. They're, par they're poking out over here. So look at this. It's kind of interesting. Remember, we put this polygon at ground level. But in urban areas, <laughs> what they've done is they have um, built 3D models of the trees. And so they have the trees up above the ground level. So see this box here where it says terrain? If you turn off terrain, now it's not building a 3D model of the trees like it was before. It's even more obvious if we go over to Marshall's campus because it's got the buildings on Marshall's campus built in 3D. So if I turn on the terrain over here, like, uh, OK, it's, I, I guess we can't turn off the buildings. Buildings maybe are separate from the terrain. Boy, now it's really exploded. All right, so the terrain is on, including the trees. So if you have an area of interest shape file, um, remember it's at ground level, and the buildings and trees could be poking up above that. So I was initially thrown off because I was building an area of interest file. Let me rotate. Ooh, I'm going to get motion sick here. Back to our area of interest. Yeah, so if the trees are sticking out, then you can just turn off the terrain, and then your area of interest is more obvious. All right, so why bring up Google Earth Pro? Sometimes you have to do a reasonableness check. Like if you're not sure if the units in WMS are set right, because there's a little bit of manual interaction you have to do. Um, so you, what you could do is you could measure something in Google Earth Pro and then check it in WMS. So for example, what do I mean? Um, let's zoom in on the mall. OK, so how long is the mall? That's something that we could measure on Google Earth Pro with this ruler here. If we want to know the length in meters from one end of the mall to the other, OK, it looks like that's 608 meters. So that could be useful if you're in WMS and you draw a line and it says that it's 200 meters, but then you measure it here and it says it's 600 meters, probably what you've done is you've defined uh, traditional units when you should have defined SI units. If things are off by like a factor of three to one, that's like a classic clue that there's a units mismatch between meters and um, the traditional units. Um, so Google Earth Pro is useful for that. Um, it's also useful for doing a rough approximation of watershed boundaries. So what I mean by that is you can zoom in on a location and you can just follow the ridge line to get an idea of a watershed. So let me show you an example. I'm going to turn the terrain back on. So with the terrain on, so over here on Blue Sulphur Road by the Boy Scout camp, 
Camp Arrowhead BSA. Okay, so if you start to pan, you can get a sense for where the ridge lines are. So see, this is a ridge line all through here. Okay, so if I wanted to trace that watershed, what I could do is make a polygon, add a polygon, and I'm just going to trace the boundaries of that watershed across the top of the ridge line and get an approximation through here, the measurements, it's telling me that the area in acres of that watershed, 92.6 acres. Now this is a pretty rough approximation. I just, you know, by panning around a couple of times got a sense of where the, where the uh, ridge lines are in that polygon. And, uh, you know, if I drew it another time, I may, I'm, I might have forgotten or I click in a different location. But it's an order of magnitude estimate, okay, about 90 acres again. It's an order of magnitude estimate that's useful, like if you have the computer do an automatic delineation of the watershed, and it says 500 acres, and you're like, well, that seems high. You can use this to just do a really coarse estimate of where the watershed is, check the area, and then it'll either verify that the automated way did it correctly and that the units are assigned the way that they ought to be, or it would tell you, no, something's off, you have to change your projection, you have to change your units. So um, Google Earth Pro is useful as kind of just a, a way of checking on things like watershed areas, lengths, and so on. So that's it. That's all I wanted to show you today is uh, those tools and databases to be aware of because we're going to be getting more and more automated, but it's still useful to know how to double check things if you're skeptical about the answer you get from the automated systems. So remember that this homework that I've just put onto Blackboard today is due on Friday of this week, but I think you'll find it pretty straightforward. The web soil survey, you should breeze through that. And then the uh, unit hydrograph time of concentration stuff is related to things we covered last week. So let me know if you've got any questions. My office hours today would normally be from 2 till 4, but I'll be in meetings until 3.30. So today I'll be available from 3.30 onward as long as anybody's got questions. So feel free to stop by.